Yeah. 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 Everybody. Any over here? Yes, sir. All righty. Good morning, everybody. Well, Secretary Carter, I want to give uh, my uh, thanks for you taking the time this morning to come to the U.S. Naval War College at Newport, uh, Rhode Island, and answer some hard questions from our officers here who've uh, come to ask those. I want to prime the pump with a couple of questions that, uh, that we've gotten uh, in order to get, uh, uh, get the ball going. I know you want to uh, uh, immediately uh, hear from them. Yeah, can I just, I just, I just first of all, thank you. And Ronald, well, thanks very much. Uh, appreciate, appreciate your leadership of this place, centrally important place to us. Um, and so I'm grateful to you and the dean and, and, and uh, all the other leadership. Uh, continuing education, continuing self-improvement is uh, a, a more and more a part of life in the United States and around the world in general. So organizations are finding it necessary to help people stay up, keep up, stay competitive in the course of their career. So what is done here is to me centrally important to my force of the future thinking, which is trying to look generations down the line and making sure that we're state of the art in how we handle people, uh, as well as state of the art in, in terms of how we handle uh, Warcraft and uh, technology and all the rest that goes into this. It's a really important place uh, for me and I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here. Just wanted to say that. All right, I appreciate that. Uh, my first question has to do with a national security strategy. Uh, here at the War College uh, in our strategy and policy course, uh, we, uh, our senior officers, have been uh, looking at long-term competition. And one of the examples we draw from is the British experience with overstretch or overreach in the late 19th and uh, early 20th century. So given our current budget constraints, aggression, with Russia, continued conflict in the Middle East, our international terrorism threat, um, how can we afford, what are the costs and the risks associated with continuing a balance or a pivot toward East Asia and the Pacific? Well, uh, the reality is we gotta do it all. And your question is, can we do it all? But let me just remind you what all is, because yes, there's the long-term competitive situation, that's the only word you can use for it, with Russia and China, uh, which is a position they have chosen, uh, but one that we need to meet with steadiness and strength and deterrence. Uh, and since they're at the higher end and have generally greater geographic reach than others, that is a stretch for our capabilities, but we're investing a lot in them. And the, and the Asia Pacific, especially important because it's, it's the single place of the in the world, single region of the world of most consequence, simply by dint of the fact that it has half the population and half the global economy. So it's a big, gonna be a big deal for the United States. Then you get to the, what I'll call the hardy perennials, North Korea and Iran, uh, and a little bit lower down the, the line, but still quite worrisome, um, both behaviorally and in terms of capabilities that they're developing themselves or getting from somewhere else. And then you've got ISIL, which we're gonna beat, but it, that takes a certain amount of resources to defeat them, and I'm certain we'll do that. Uh, but there's a certain amount of preoccupation that goes with uh, conducting that war uh, and winning it. So those are the five things that are currently on the plate, and then you always have to have in the back of your mind that our historical record is perfect in never having it right. What's the next big thing? And so staying agile, flexible, uh, well, wide area field of view, uh, excellent, keeping the edge, uh, all that is essential for what might come down the road. So now, can we do it all? Well, we can do it all. Uh, uh, obviously, if you're talking about resources, you'd always like to have more uh, resources. My biggest concern is not with the right now, but in the years ahead, I think we have the right mindset. Uh, we have determination, we have uh, public support. I was at ROTC at Yale, where when I went to college, I'll tell you, the climate was so different, not for me, but for most of the people I went to school uh, with, and ROTC wasn't welcome, and it was a big deal. So we had the support of our 
society. Uh, we have the fact that we're attracted, a lot of people around the world like to work with us. They like you, many of them are here. We like working with other people. We're effective partners. Uh, we treat people decently. We represent things that other people want and they want to associate uh, with. So we kind of have all the friends and the allies and our enemies don't have any. Our opponents don't, don't have any. Nobody, nobody likes them. Nobody wants to work with them. Uh, so we got a lot of strengths. Um, the my biggest concern I have down the road is, is uh, at, at this particular moment, in terms of budget and resources, is I hope that we're not going to see the collapse of the bipartisan budget uh, agreement. If we, we've got to have some budget stability. We can manage within, you know, okay, we're, we understand we're not going to get everything we want. Nobody ever gets everything they want, but uh, we need stability. Uh, we need stability to plan. Our industries need stability. Our people need to know what their future is. Our friends need to know that we're with them. Our enemies need to know we're strong. And so that kind of stability, and we had a two-year budget deal, which was done in the right way, which is Washington getting out of gridlock, coming together, both parties, putting the whole schmear on the table, not just discretionary spending, but revenues and entitlements. Because remember, they're the lion's share. You can't balance the budget on the backs of us. This is just, the, the money's not there. Uh, so it just doesn't work. So you gotta have everything in. There it was, and it was supposed to be a two-year budget deal. Now six months into it, they're passing bills that call into question the, whether that is gonna collapse or not. That worries me a lot, because on the other side of that is $100 billion of sequester cuts. That's what happens if the budget deal collapses and we go back to, to sequester. So that's my principal uh, worry. Strategically, we know what we're doing. Obviously, we'd like to have more. We always like to have more, but we can do what we need to do. Um, uh, I, but I can't uh, uh, pretend that I know we figured out how to do that with a hundred billion dollars less in coming years. I, that, that I'm not, I don't doubt is going to be possible. Okay, well, I, I'm going to follow up one question then open it up to the floor. Since you were talking about budget, uh, over a week ago you spoke at the um, Navy's League uh, Sea, Air, and Space mm -hmm. Expo, and you pushed back a little bit on uh, uh, recommendations from the Senate Armed Services Committee uh, uh, in the National Defense Authorization Act uh, with reference to uh, acquisition reform. Mm -hmm. And given your uh, long service and expertise in acquisition, uh, I wanted to give you an opportunity to amplify, sure. uh, as well as you, you talked a little bit, if you give us some comments, you talked about um, the balance with Congress in terms of providing oversight versus micromanagement yeah, of the yeah, defense. Budget. Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, there are some good things in there, and there are many well-intentioned things in these bills. To get to your second point, however, these bills are now a 1,000 pages long. They have hundreds of provisions. And in one year, they add boxes to our organization chart, and the next year, they take boxes away uh, and I, I just on principle, I believe that that kind of micromanagement is not helpful. Uh, lots of reports required, that kind of thing. And I think our leadership um, uh, is the best source of good management ideas. That's why we're here. If you don't like us, they can find another crowd of us. But that's that the management of the place ought to manage the place and not be micromanaged. Now that said, uh, I, you know we, we've got to work with our committees. At the end of the day, they have the final say on our money and on the law. Um, and they're, 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 I, I appreciate the spirit behind much of what is going on. I understand very well the frustration with acquisition because I share it. Uh, I understand um, the desire to keep pushing us to think about how we're organized and structured. That's fair enough. I'm okay with that. But. I, have, I do have problems with, with parts of it, and I, I, hope, I hope we're able to work this out, but we'll see. Uh, the one you specifically reference is a proposal that I, is not quite clear to me, but ha has the effect, if I understand it right, of separating research and engineering from procurement, which is you know, sort of like violating the 
third law of thermodynamics or something. It, 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 you know, if, if anything, we have a problem perennially of connecting the research and development enterprise to the production enterprise. The last thing in the world we need is bureaucratic. To me, there's way too much of that. So if there was a proposal that was bringing them together further, I'd, I, it would make more sense to me. So I'm still trying to make sense of it. We'll talk to them. We'll try to get uh, somewhere better in that regard. But I couldn't support something that, that enforced that separation. I just know better. And, and we, we uh, our history over time, and I've been doing this a long time, as, as, as uh, Admiral Howe referenced. Um, I go back to Harold Brown was my first boss, also a physicist, by the way. Uh, but you know, in Harold's day, the, and Harold had been director of research and engineering, and that meant the buying guy too. I mean, it, it meant a, it was at &L. It's just we renamed it over time. So um, uh, that one I, I really can't uh, support, and there are other ones that are, I can't uh, support in there. And I would uh, uh, respectfully appeal to the, the committees to stick to the big things and not have a lot of little uh, you know, move this around and move that around. Uh, I, I, it's almost impossible to believe that from that remove, they can have a better perspective on what we need to manage ourselves. It's not that there's anything wrong with them, and it's not that they don't understand many things, but we're right in the thick of it, and I think that the, our senior leadership, our chiefs, our service chiefs, our service secretaries, myself, uh, ought to have the latitude to organize our environment and not have it organized for us. Okay, appreciate that. Uh, we'll take questions. Remember to use the mic uh, when, uh, because this has been uh, broadcast. You have a question there in the middle. Yes, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Erica Jordan with the Defense Contract Management Agency. Mm -hmm. Sir, in the past, reducing oversight of defense contractors has been less than successful. One prime example would be the future combat systems. Why do you think that increasing their in value management system threshold? will result in better defense contract management as well as reducing I'm sorry, increasing, I just missed the last part. Current value management system threshold. Uh, well, uh, uh, first of all, uh, DCMA is a great organization and a very essential one. And I think the, the, the question, I don't know that everybody could, could, could hear, was um, uh, basically about, uh, I'll put it in this, these terms, the balance between ceding to the contractor uh, a lot of control over program execution rather than keeping con tight control and oversight on the government side. That's a difficult balance. You're right. Uh, Future Combat Systems was an example where we outsourced the systems engineering, configuration control, e everything. And that was the rage at the time, you know. Let industry do it. They'll have the expertise to it. Well, that didn't work almost all the time. It failed. And uh, so you're right. The pendulum needs to come, uh, come back. Now, not all the way back, because I do want there to be shared responsibility and shared expertise in industry. And also, I need to be careful about what we can take on, because to be blunt about it, our acquisition system is uneven. Some parts of it are up to that job, and other parts we need to work on and get up to that job. DCMA is an inestimable help in all this, I should say, uh, say that. So it's, a, it's, it, 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 it's something that I think where the pendulum has swung back in the direction of more government, direct government involvement, but there's a consequence to that, which is we've got to get better at it on the government side. That's the civilian side and the uniform side, and that's, that's related to something else that comes up in the Goldwater Nichols discussion of acquisition, which is the role of the services uh, and the service chiefs in acquisition. And I think that's very important. That's an area also where the pendulum swung too far, and the, the, the the service chiefs basically didn't have anything to do with acquisition for 15, 20 years or so, or not nearly enough. And, and I think that was the pendulum going too far. I'd like to see it get back the other way, but I've told the chiefs, in order to do that, you have to educate yourselves. Because most of you, 
and most of the senior leadership by now in all the services have gotten there not because of their expertise and acquisitions. That was the way it was when I started out in the Cold War. Because remember, we, that was a time we never actually did anything. We just got ready to do things. And so, well, and so over the decades, getting, being good at getting ready to do things was what made you proficient in your service. And so acquisition executives rose to the top. That, that nodded, there's nothing wrong with this, but we've had a more operational set of decades, and so we have, tend to have more operators uh, at the top, and so these guys need to get in the game, but I'm telling them, you, you need to be humble about what you really uh, understand. We need your understanding of what the requirements are, we need your management and leadership acumen, but you're also gonna have to understand uh, you know, how to manage big programs, how to deal with technology and so forth, and that's not something that, that, it, that is in your background. Right. Next question, there in the back, yes. So good morning, uh, Astrid Papp, uh, despite my New England draw, I'm from the Royal Australian Navy. Uh, most of us are about to uh, embark on the, the, perhaps the next phase of our careers at very senior levels. Uh, some of my compatriots are about to be promoted to admiral, of course, when they get back. But you talk about uh, half the population and half of the trade in, uh, in Asia, the Western Pacific. Um, we're seeing, uh, though no one has figured out the algorithm yet, we're seeing a new model of pushing the boundaries of a global rules-based order particularly by Russia, uh, through the Ukraine, et cetera, yep. uh, and in the Black Sea, and then um, China in not only the South, but the East China Sea and further out into the Blue Continent. What's the tipping point that uh, forces the international community to say, hey, that's enough, uh, without boxing an adversary into a corner where they have to come out swinging? We're about to go and live very complex uh, and volatile environment. We're the ones who are going to have to untangle these threads that are becoming more and more tightly twisted. What's your advice for perhaps your countrymen and also for your allies on where that needs to go, and where that tipping point exists between saying enough is enough and doing something about it? A uh, good, good, good question. First of all, let me just salute our Aussie friends everywhere around the world, including at this very moment. In the places you know about, a number of places we can't talk about here, but you probably individually know about, we're like this with the Australians in so many ways. And, I, and it's, it's a country that, like the United States to its great credit, uh, re require regards itself as having a responsibility for the global order. And then that gets to your question. Then there are some who evidently don't. We either want to challenge that or have an intensely self-absorbed view of how to conduct themselves internationally. And in their very different ways, Russia and China uh, fit that general uh, description. My view is that this, uh, that just looking at the leadership of those uh, two countries and their current inclination, uh, this isn't going to change soon. And now it's having the effect of isolating them because everybody, you're talking in Europe, it's the NATO side, and in the Asia Pacific, almost all countries are reaching out. And look at Vietnam and the United States just in the last few days uh, with the president. Now, you know, why is that? It's because they know that, that stability and security is what's created the Asian miracle and that it could be threatened by this kind of instability and they want to be on the side of keeping a system that has the uh, uh, trade values and the human values uh, that have made that part of the world uh, work. So I think you got to look at this as a long, uh, I, I, I don't see there being a, um, uh, barring something, uh, uh, sort of some sort of instability in those two countries, which I also don't see happening. Given, given the current leadership, I think this is going to be the trend for quite a while, and we need to be in it for the long term. So this is going to be a long uh, 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 campaign of firmness and gentle but strong pushback. 
uh, uh, for probably quite a number of years in both places. Now, I also believe that the internal logic as was true with the Soviet Union over those many decades, and again, a different situation, but only similar in this respect. The internal logic which, sugge which, which suggests that this isn't really what's in the interest of the Chinese or the Russian people in the long run, that that will prevail at some point. But that's almost academic at this point because their, way, their leadership is way on the other side of that equation right now. So I think we have to, uh, you know, uh, uh, brace in for the long run. That's certainly our approach. Our, our, our rebalance isn't a, a couple of year thing or a do this for a little while and try it out kind of thing. This is a long term commitment. After all, we've been at it for 70 years. And we'll stay at it uh, because we have been the pivotal military power in the region and the linchpin of security and stability in that part of the world. We're going to keep it that way. That's what the rebalance is about for a long time. Okay, last question. Over there in the back. Good morning, sir. Major Dylan Patterson uh, from the Air National Guard. A couple of years ago, your predecessor, uh, former Secretary Hagel, was here, uh, not at the War College, but he was speaking to a group in the industry. Um, and he made some comments regarding the proliferation of advanced weapons into adversaries, uh, both state and non-state actors. Uh, when, when you look at some of those weapons, a lot of it is, uh, you know, unmanned systems, stuff in the cyber domain, um, and the nature of development in that area seems to be a lot faster, along, along Moore's Law, progressing, you know, every 18 months, two years, as opposed to yeah. building capital ships, which take years and years to develop. Um, an example might be um, Nigeria, who we have some, some students here from Nigeria, they're procuring unmanned systems from China instead of us. So when we look at the, the ability for competing defense systems um, to develop stuff very fast. How does our process, whether it's uh, the PPPE process or our defense uh, foreign military cells, I, recognizing that's probably Secretary Kerry's question, but if you answer that, I won't, I won't tell him. <laughs> his line. It's actually how, both of our questions. How do we align our acquisition and development process and getting that to our partner nations so our equipment, our tools, and our partners' tools can keep pace with an adversary? Good question. It, two things. First of all, we're too slow, uh, and that's a problem. And if you want to really want to go after acquisition, you don't take our research and engineering and separate it from acquisition. That was my point earlier. They've got to come together faster because the, the, the future is going to go to those who are agile, creative, up-to-date, competitive. And yeah, there are some things like uh, capital ships that naturally go on longer uh, time scales, but un unfortunately, a lot of the reflex of our acquisition system is to operate on that kind of time scale, which, as you point out, is completely inappropriate when it comes to things like drones, when it comes to things like cyber. And uh, so that's a, a, a very big preoccupation of mine, and it's, it's, the, it's the central reason why you see me pushing so hard to connect us with the tech community and rebuild those bridges that were so strong when I started out in this business between the technical community in the country at large and the defense world. Uh, that was a union bred in this country in World War II. Uh, it lasted for a few generations thereafter, including mine. Uh, and now it's, it, it's, it's just not a natural thing. People, they don't know us and our problems. They don't know how to work with us as easily. We have to, but, but, but it, it's also no longer true as it was when I started out that all technology or most technology of consequence originated in the United States and originated in the defense or government environment. That's just not true anymore. So we have to have a different model where we're connected. That's why you see me out in Silicon Valley, up in Boston, out in Austin. And so we're trying to get the most vibrant parts of our tremendously innovative country harnessed to the United States. Now, these guys want to do it. You talk to them, they, they, they're patriotic, they care about, I mean, in the main, mm -hmm. uh, they care uh, about uh, the country and the world. Uh, they know they can't, that everything they do has no meaning if, if there's no security. Uh, they, they, they're people who like to make a difference. They like to do things that matter. They like to do things that are consequential, and they know that what we do is consequential. So I find the uptake is really great. 
but I've got to work real hard on that, and I urge all of you to do the same. We just can't sit back and expect that it's all going to come to us anymore. That's, that's, that's long in the past, and we can't expect that we can do things on 10 and 15 year timescales. The export control system, I don't even want to get started on. Uh, I, I, there's so many, uh, oh, that's a nice word to, to uh, archaic aspects uh, of that system. It makes your head hurt. And uh, so you're right. So we're frequently behind. And it would be better, given that country X is going to have a certain system, it would be better if they got it from us. Because at least we'd be in there. And it would be part of our partnership and so forth. But to stand back and say, well, we don't want to do that. So we're going to let somebody else sell the identical item into that country. That doesn't make any sense to me. That's cutting off our nose to spite our face. And yet we do that again and again and again. Uh, so it's a serious problem. And I, uh, I, uh, I, I did when I was at &L a number of things to speed us up. We're still too slow, but we're a lot faster now. We have, we, we have basically fast tracks for stuff. But then we do wait for the diplomatic approval. And I respect my diplomatic uh, colleagues and their views uh, and so forth. But the results here don't add up. They don't make sense. It's not uh, uh, a sensible uh, system. But I think that is, in all fairness, secondary to our need to pull our own socks up and get faster and more uh, agile. Otherwise, we are going to be left behind. We can be generations behind. Just believe, and believe me, there are areas right now where we're way behind. We're trying to catch up, but we're two or three generations uh, uh, behind. And, you know, the enemy, just take ISIL, for example. ISIL is quite agile on the net. They're barbarians, but they're good with the internet. Now, we're trying to eliminate that capability from them. That's what I've got Cybercom doing, which would be our first real cyber campaign uh, in Iraq and Syria, and take that freebie, that command and control freebie away from them and make that part of crushing them in uh, Iraq and, and Syria. But, you know, 10 years even, certainly 20 years ago, that wouldn't have been an aspect of the conflict. It's got to be an aspect of the conflict now. And we got to get in the game and be, be good at it. All right, well, thanks for taking time today. you have any final comments before? Well, I just to say how much I appreciate that the I don't know what it feels like to you all to be here uh, in terms of your overall careers, um, but I'm going to tell you how it looks to me, and this is to my international friends as well. To the international people here, thank you for being with us. We don't take it for granted. I think, you know, at our best, working together, we represent the civilized no other way to say it, world, uh, protecting itself, protecting its people, letting them do what they deserve to do, which is live their lives and dream their dreams and have peace. Uh, and that is a wonderful thing. So thank you for th those who are, who are not American here for being with us. And for the folks from the American uh, uh, military and, and our civilian counterparts uh, as well, all our DOD family, uh, it, your being here represents your awareness that in today's world, we're never out of school. We're never out of school. This idea that you graduate from school when you're 16 years old or 20 years old, and then that's it, and you live for the rest of your life, that's, 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 that's gone now. Everybody needs to be constantly learning, constantly um, uh, changing because we all individually need to be competitive as well as collectively be competitive. So I need people and I need to get that, that have that edge because I need the best because in the end of the day our military is the best in the world because our people are so good. And I, I, I can't count on people like you generation after generation after generation. Uh, I've got to work hard just like I have to work hard at connecting the technology base. I have to work hard at connecting to the population and getting them to join us, getting once they've joined us to stick with us. And when they've decided to stick with us, continuing to give them opportunities to grow and change, assume more responsibility by having more capability. That's what this place re represents. So it's, it's an extremely important institution to me. It's a highly successful one. And uh, you know, I look forward a little bit later, I'm going to try to learn from you what your scholars and what you're thinking 
uh, can provide me in the way of advice, but its principal purpose is to educate people who are already highly successful and give them that sort of extra jet pack uh, to go further. And uh, it's extremely valuable. It's an incredible part of improving the readiness and the prowess of our force. So congratulations on being here. Well, thank you very much. Today. Thank you. Thank you very much.